I tell you, I had these knockdown, drag out arguments with God. I was like, why can't I have what everybody else has? Like all these other people, they are all married. So I had two dreams where I was shown my husband. This is Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God, because God is speaking to you and me and the church and the world. And here we get to listen in on the conversations, these collisions of heaven and earth, these encounters with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences. Welcome. I am your host, Trapper Jack. Wait for it. Wait for it. How long must I wait for it? You ever pray for patience? Don't do that. I, <laughs> why do I say that? I don't, I, you can do whatever you want to. I, don't, I never pray for patience. You know why? What's it going to make me do? Wait, he's going he's gonna to have me practicing my waiting, my patience. So I figure I get enough of that anyway. So it's not something I pray for. Sometimes, perhaps we should invite God into that conversation. And actually, I have three women here who do beautifully invite God into the conversation. But in each case, when they're waiting, it's a killer. It's a killer. Okay, I've got to use her Tammy. We'll get to Tammy. She's, you know, she, she's in her 40s. She's in her 40s. And it's like, where is he, right? Where is he? How long do I have to wait? And God, meanwhile, has the perfect guy for her, has it all set up, going to give her dreams and everything, but not now, in your 40s. And then we're going to go back, and we're going to see. We have to go back. I want to, oh, Vicky. Yeah, Vicky's the one who actually was given a vision of her guy. He's coming. This is a little part of his life. And oh, there he is. A decade plus before he walked, you know, how long you have to wait for these kinds of things. But God is always faithful. And thankfully, he doesn't tell us we have to wait 10 years. Otherwise, we'd pull our hair out and go nuts. So he doesn't tell us. He just gives us hope, right? He's good on hope, actually. He's very good. I, I find him to be very good on hope. And that is coming someday. And that you never wait alone. You never wait alone. And we're going to start with Gina. You may remember Gina. She, was, she wasn't she was waiting so much early on for the guy. It's, it's when things went sour, when she started praying for something in particular, that she had to wait a long time. Ready? Wait for it. Because I've always loved Our Lady. I said, Our Lady, can you send me someone like Joseph? I'm ready to get married now. And then probably a year later on my wedding day, I'm like, oh my God, snap back into me. My husband's name is Joseph. <laughs> all right. All is good? Uh, no. Uh, wrong guy. With my whole thing with my marriage, I was very lonely in my marriage. It was, it was a bit sad. I look back. It was sad. Is Joe the wrong guy? Never stop praying. Never give up hope. You, you know, never 25 years, 25 years of on my knees praying for my husband. So I just want to explain, um, this is the hard part, and I talked to my husband about it, but before my husband and I were together, my husband um, and his girlfriend had an abortion, and he explained to us when we started dating, and um, it was a really deep, deep hurt for him. And my husband was not big, he was, he was brought up Catholic, went to Catholic, went to all boy Catholic school but he wasn't into church like I was into church. And so um, I, it's so weird because I don't even know why I did this. The night before we got married, we had a rehearsal. rehearsal, And I said, Joey, you got to go to confession. You, got, you have to like, you know, talk to a priest about this because I don't want this coming on our family. And so I, the whole wedding party went to confession. Some of my friends just re recently related to those. That was the last time I went to your confession was like 29 years ago. I'm like, oh, wow, well, maybe, maybe you should go back. But I did have confession for everyone before they got, before I got married the next day. So Gina has child number one, child number two, and a marriage that's falling apart. My 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 marriage is not good at this point. Like after I had my second daughter, he wasn't coming to church. Um, my husband came, became really resentful of me going to church because the more that God gives me, the more that I um, want to give back to Him. Like to, so, then now I'm going to daily mass, and I love daily mass. It's my favorite thing in the world because it's so quiet and. And contemplate everything. So this is when the fun part comes in. Graduation, my daughter's graduation. 
we're taking pictures. I can send you all these pictures. We're taking pictures of like my daughter and my aunt, my daughter and my me, my daughter and my mom and dad. And then there's a picture of our lady. And then there's a picture of my daughter and her, and her sister. Why is there a picture of our lady in the middle of the... I mean, of a, of a real person or is it... Uh... Expl- no, it's disc- a statue, a picture of a statue. That you didn't take? I did not take. I don't even know who this Mary is. I've never seen this type of Mary. Why? I knew she was Mary, but I didn't know what Mary this was. Really? I brought it to my priest, and he's like, that's kind of weird. This what this girl that I go to daily mass with, I said, Jill, because she knows a lot more than me. And I'm like, Jill, what Mary is this? Is this is this Mary of like the sacred heart? I couldn't find it. I was trying to Google everything. She goes, Gina, that's our lady of Medjugorje. I'm like, what? Cause our lady of Medjugorje is different looking. She's not like our lady of grace. Uh, but as queen, as our lady queen of peace is what she is over there. I have all the pictures of it and it, it was a blue sky and it was the same statue that's a- on top of apparition Hill, that statue. Oh, really? Yes. You have a picture of the statue up on, on Apparition Hill. Yes, in the middle of my daughter's graduation pictures. Wow. And it wasn't like it was at the end. It was like in the middle, Our Lady put it there. Yeah. <laughs> I would call that a calling. <laughs> yeah, that's a calling to go to Medjugorje, I would think. So me and my best friend, do you want to come to Medjugorje with me? And she, she, for some odd reason, she said yes. So we booked to go over to Medjugorje. I, I know that Mary's calling me. She puts this picture in the middle of Allie's graduation. So me and, Chris, me and my friend go over to Medjugorje. I was in Medjugorje March 18th, 2018. So the first day I got up really early. I'm an early riser. I'm walking around and I met this priest there. And his name is Father Michael Dwyer. Have you heard of him? I think I have. Does he have any uh, physical disabilities? He does. He 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 uh, he can't walk all that well. Yeah, but when he prays, when he prays on people, they 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 they're going out in the spirit and having all kinds of experiences, right? Well, wait until I tell you that story. All right. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So I meet this priest. And I said, oh, you know, Father, I always see a priest. I asked, can you bless me? He blessed me. He goes, I'll see you at confession tonight. I'm like, all right. Well, I guess I'm going to confession tonight. So um, I went back to my friends, and I don't remember what we did. We probably, oh, we went up to Apparition Hill. And, you know, it was a, she prayed that her, she would have faith because my, my friend wasn't all that faithful. And so then we went to confession. And when we're in the confession line, Father Michael Dwyer comes out of the confessional. There's a line. We're waiting for like two hours. My girlfriend is not going to confession in 20 years. He comes up to her and says, and she's ready to leave. He's like, please don't go anywhere. He went, he went to the men's room, came back and said to her, please don't leave. And she's like, what the heck just happened? She goes in the confession before I do. She's in there for a long time. So when she went in there, she had a conversion. She felt Jesus hug her, and she walked out a different person. She's the most devoted Catholic I know. She came out a different person. I tell you, the confessions at Magigoria. It's key. It, it's everything. It really is. Well, you it know, is everything. Those confessionals, and there's what fifty-seven of them, and they add oh, yeah. more chairs when when there's that's not enough, uh, and more priests are listening. But I tell you, they are so powerful. They're, the the conversion stories are endless, uh, including for men who become priests. Endless. Yeah, they say yes. I, I believe that because I I have experienced two people that have complete lives have changed. When I went, so it was me time for me to go into confessional. So I go into the confessional, and I'm, you know I'm a daily communicant. I go to confession maybe like once every two months or something like that. So I say my confessions and he's like, Gina, why are you here? And I looked at him and I said, I'm here for Thanksgiving for my daughter. And he said, that daughter will be fine. You're here for your husband. I'm like, my husband? Like, why? I'm not even thinking about him. Like, why am I here for my husband? He goes, you have to pray for your husband. And I'm like, 
oh, okay. Like, I'm like, my husband? Never mentioned my husband. He, I, don't even, I don't even wear a wedding ring. So he read my soul. Like, I, Father Michael Dwyer read my soul. Like, he is he's amazing. He's, a, he's amazing. Yeah. I know that his line is really long. <laughs> his line oh, yeah. is always, he's, it's like, where is he? People go looking for him. Is he up here tonight? He's you a know? rock star. Yeah, he is yeah. a rock star. Yeah. And he saved my, my girlfriend. Oh my goodness. My, my girlfriend, like her life has, was changed drastically that day. She is, oh my goodness. And for me, pray, um, this is leading. Jesus. My, my, I have a rocky road. Let me tell you, it's hills and valleys. So I go back, I give my husband the rosary beads and he's like, what's this? I'm like, just someone told me, I said, someone told me to give these to you. That's all I said. So when I got back from Medjugorje, my husband was, was like, I think I we need to separate because he was really mad that I was so, I mean, when I came back, oh my goodness, like God's grace has shot he has showered so much upon me i just oh i have no words for it i think of my life before medjugorje and after medjugorje there was definitely a split and like total trust in jesus like give myself completely a year goes by and i said oh i think i want to go to medjugorje and my husband said to me i want to go to medjugorje and i looked at him like are you nuts like you were going to divorce me like for going to medjugorje like he was like I don't think I can, I don't think I can be married to you since you are so into your religion. I, I really do have true love for my husband. And I did so many sacrifices for him because I wanted him to be with me in heaven. I do. I love my husband. And out of so, nowhere, literally out of nowhere, no, was there any other sign he was starting to shift in any way? No, no, no. All of a sudden, no. I just want to go to Magigoria. He wants to go to Medjugorje. I'm like, all right, I'm booking it right now before you change your mind. Like, literally booked it that day. So we went to Medjugorje. That night, I'm like, okay, we're going to go to confession now. And he's like, okay. And he hadn't been to confession in, uh, I don't know, since our wedding. So he went to confession. He went into the confessional. I don't know who his priest was, some Irish priest. He was in there for a long time. He came out a different man. He walked in there one way. He came out a different way. It was show. It shows on his face. I have pictures of him before and after. He is a guy's guy. He plays hockey. He has all his friends he plays cards with. After he got out of confession from Medjugorje, he called up every single one of his friends and told them that God is real and God loves you. And that this is, Gina's not messing around. She's not crazy. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. You had to be going, who are you and what you do with my husband? I was like, thanks be to God. I've been praying for this for 25 years. It was our wedding anniversary. So we came out, he came out a different person. Now he's on fire. He's leading the rosary. I'm like, who is this guy leading the rosary up Cross Mountain? I have a picture on, on his face with rosaries around him. He has a Mary shirt on and is beaming. He was forgiven. He was forgiven for everything. God's mercy. Oh, that's all we need. I wish the world would know this. Like God's mercy, God's mercy. And mm -hmm. it's, and it works. <laughs> it works. Oh, boy, does it work. The graces were flooding in. Did he explain oh, what happened? Did he talk about it? Um, I would like for him, like, I asked him, like, would you ever talk, you know, on this podcast? He goes, well, I have to think about that. Cause I had to tell him what I was going to tell you today. I told him that I would tell, if I had to get permission for him to tell you about the abortion. And I'm not going to use that. It's not, it's not uh, important I would, to the story. Well, I want you to use it. No, we have permission. I want you to use it. Cause I want to know that men, if they go to confession, they're suffering. Oh, I see what the you're saying. Suffering, the suffering that he did through our marriage and the suffering that I, that was then turned on me because he didn't feel like he was man enough, but like he was set free from that chain in the confessional. So much so he caught when he he texted his old girlfriend when he came back and apologized to her. Oh, I was a blabbering idiot. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. He said, "I'm sorry for what what part of it." For a, 
being involved with the abortion. He said he's sorry. Okay. He was sorry to the to the girl to the girl. Yeah, yeah. Which was that he wouldn't have done that before. But he was. I mean, when I first met him, he was pro-abortion, and now my husband is an open pro-lifer. Wow. I mean, this is not the same man. I love my husband. My husband is so wonderful now. Like he, he goes to church. Like if I, if I'm like traveling, he goes to church on his own. He loves to go to, he go, loves to go to mass. He, we're never late. Like, and before I could never even, you know, they asked him to go to mass. It would be like a fight. My husband has changed. He's the man that I've always prayed that I knew Je- that was in him. Jesus has shown himself in him. Medjugorje saved our marriage. It really did. And I was doing, no one else, when I, when I emailed you, I listened to what, I don't know what show it was. This woman, Anita was praying for her husband. And I, and I like, I like more people have to know that Jesus, if you're praying for your husband, that Jesus is listening, no matter what the circumstances are, never stop praying, never give up hope. You, you know, never 25 years, 25 years of on my knees praying for my husband. Have you have you have you been able to are you, are, do does anybody ask you to kind of like come in the church and talk and give a talk? No, I'm not that person. I give No, you are that person. You are that person. Uh, this is what the church is missing. This is this is conversion. This is conversion for people when they hear your kind of story. It gives and it gives fortification too because moms need to hear this, dads need to hear this that just keep praying, you know? Husbands and wives need to hear this. Keep praying. Because this, to me, this is what the church is missing. I keep, I'm a broken record on this, but there yeah. needs to be a venue for this beyond a Touched by Heaven podcast. There needs to be a venue within the church that says, come in and tell your story because you have a doozy. I do. God is so good to me. God has been so good to me. Oh my goodness. And uh, how are you and uh, Joe getting along? Oh, we love each other. We pray together every night. He's very outspoken about his faith. And he's also very persecuted about his faith with his friends. Mm, I'm they sure. They call him Vatican Joe, but he doesn't care. And his family, too. <laughs> his family makes fun of him. But they have to acknowledge something happened. That it play, That's what it, everyone says about him. It plays on him. Trust me, it plays on him. Yes, it does. And it's made a big impact in people around him, too, like, but I'm, he is persecuted, though. I yeah. do have to say that. All right, let's uh, let's go to the takeaways. Can you wrap it up? Uh, and what what, the, what our big takeaway is? My big takeaway is to always, no matter what you're going through, no matter what stage of your life, Our Lady is there. Jesus is there. If you ask, He will give you everything that is good for your soul. Never give up hope. Twenty five years. Never give up hope. And God is good, and I don't know, everything. God is everything. God bless you. Thank you. I'll be praying for you and for your ministry. You're doing a wonderful job. You're really getting the word out to so many people. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gina. What a great lesson in persistent prayer, in prayer in general, of course, and the transformational power of the confessional at a place that is called the confessional of the world, Magigoria. Wow. Prayer answered eventually. And that you never wait alone. You never wait alone. Vicky, there's Vicky. You know, she's she has this vision. She's praying for her future husband. God shows Vicky the future guy. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. A decade passes. It's like, <laughs> as we uh, as we joined Vicky, she well, she had the vision in the car. And that's where we find Vicky right now. Gosh, I must have been about 20 years old. I was just praying one day, driving down the road, saying, God, please, you know, take care of my husband and prepare him for me whenever we meet. And I was listening to uh, Vangelis and uh, I think it was John Anderson. Song came on called Beside. And in the, um, while I was praying, and in the song, it talked about this little boy in the rain. So I came to a stoplight <laughs> and, um, and I was at the light. My mind was, you know, going everywhere. And then all, all of a sudden my, my uh, thoughts just kind of stopped in this vision. I just saw this picture of this little boy with his hands raised up into the heavens. And um, he had this gnarled bicycle underneath him and he was in a neighborhood street. And um, I knew 
that this was going to be my husband. Um, and I knew that it was a, a message that my future husband had been in a bicycle accident and he has, uh, and he had a choice of living or dying. You, you so, picked up okay. all of that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when you get that stuff, you get it pretty quick. You know what I mean? It's like an instantaneous deal, you know? And I, because I mean, why else would a little boy, I was praying, you know, God look at it. Was, it happened immediately after when I was praying, God look after my husband and, you know, the little boy in the rain with his hands reached up and it's like, why would I see that? You know what I mean? It's like, so it's just two and two together. Here it is. No doubt. Yeah, just, yeah, real quick. No doubt. No doubt about it. Well, at the time there was no doubt about it. Now, as time passed, this was probably, I'm, I met Alex like 11 years later. When you're dating guys along the way though, you're, are you like, uh, by the way, did you ever, you know, were you ever on a bike and yeah. Yes, I did. Okay. I did. I would, uh, you know, I would be sneaky about it. Um, you know what the, the boyfriend that I had before Alex, he actually was into bikes. So bicycles and we used to ride bikes together and yeah. So yeah, (laughs) I, I tested it. Um, it just never happened. And it was a long time before it happened. So I thought, well, you know, it, I, I had doubts between then and there, but it never completely went away. Um, so yeah, there was one guy that he had a bike, he, he rode bicycles. So I thought it, maybe it was him because the guy that I married, uh, I don't, I was married for f- six months. Um, I don't think that, uh, we, I don't, I don't, I don't remember if I ever tested him or not. Oh, you did marry, um, you married somebody else first. I did. I did. You kind of gave up, uh, I'm in love yes. with this guy and therefore. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it didn't work out. Yep. You get married, you get divorced and now you're out yeah. there looking for another biker. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I saw Alex for the first time, my husband, he was, um, I was, immediately attracted to him. And a matter of fact, um, kind of back up a little bit. I told you that I had, I didn't ever really leave Jesus and leave God, but I did kind of dabble in metaphysics a little bit during my twenties because I was searching and, uh, I was at a, a meditation group and that's when I saw him. Uh, we went out and had coffee. I mean, we had a really good time with coffee. So we went and sat by a lake and, uh, that's whenever he told me, that he, and I think I probably asked him first, you know, it's like, so what was your childhood like? You know, anything happened to you? you know? <laughs> and, uh, he, uh, he says, yeah, I was actually, I was hit by a car. Um, when he was, uh, on his birthday, he had just turned six. He had just turned six and, uh, he, um, was actually pronounced dead. And, um, and his mom has the death certificate. Um, but he was, he was pronounced dead and he turned around and he like touched the nurse and he said, um, my leg hurts. And the nurse about, you know, fell out of her chair cause they thought he was gone. Um, but he ended up, uh, his lungs had collapsed and how long was he gone? Um, well, they had, uh, I think it was about 15 minutes later that they had, um, after they pronounced him, they realized he wasn't dead. So I don't, you know, um, but when, they realized he wasn't dead. He was talking. Yeah. Wow, that wow. Wild? wow. That's, yeah. that's, that's great. What happened during the death? He didn't, you know what? He had no near death experience with it. None. So yeah. he tells you the story and what do you say? I'm sitting there going, Oh my gosh, this is really happening. <laughs> and I didn't tell him because I didn't want to freak him out. You know, I mean, you know how guys can be, you know, you don't want to, Um, but it was, it was one of those things like, this is him. I, and God gave him to me and God directed us together. And this is like, so awesome. I can't believe this is really happening. How long did you (laughs) wait? How long did you wait till you had to tell him? Okay. So, um, he proposed to me like within a couple months that we were together. And, uh, so after he proposed to me, I, uh, I sat down and I told him we were eating pizza over the dining room table and. I told him what had happened. And so, um, he actually started crying. Um, and I said, well, let's, uh, you know, I need to check this. I need to make sure that this is real. I'm going to draw a picture and I want you to draw a picture of where it was. And we were pretty close. 
You know, he, uh, I saw the fence. I didn't know that there was a Winn-Dixie behind the fence, but I saw a fence where the Winn-Dixie was behind it. And then um, I saw the road that uh, the, the street that he lived on ran into, and it was about two or three houses down. Um, but, you know, as I started, like, paying attention to the vision, the vision was still there. It was pretty awesome. The vision never went away. You know, I, I could still recall it throughout my life. And I can still recall it right now. I can see it right now, you know, um, so which is, is pretty cool. But, you know, I've got a I've got a good memory. Um, again, how old were you? How old were you when you had the vision? 20 ish, probably about 20. Yeah, 20 ish. And you actually started dating at, at what age? 30. OK, so it'd be 10 30. years. It was here's your 10 year notice. 10 years. Because you never know with God. You think, oh, this is going to happen, you know, real soon. Nah, I know. It, it could be 10 I years, know. 20. You don't know. 10 years later, there he is. Yeah. Um, Why do you think God did that for you? Um, so I was open for the messages. Um, and I was open for him to tell me. I don't think that I'm anyone, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm special. I think I was just open to it and, um, and welcomed it. Um, I also had a, you know, I mean, I had a really tough, tough childhood and, um, I was always close to God during that time. You know, during my childhood, I was really, really close to God and, um, knew I, I look back and know the Holy Spirit, you know, stepped into my life so many times, um, when I was a kid and, and going through the, the crap. As you know, on a lot of these stories, um, mm-hmm. If someone's been through a really tough childhood, there seems to be this balance that God is so merciful to help you along, if you will. Do you, yeah. you, you sense that was yeah. true with yourself? Yeah, and I, I, I do believe that. And, and I, I, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I guess it, it could be, you know, obviously it's grace um, and, and mercy, um, but I think it's also being aware. Because I can, I see miracles like this happen in other people's lives, you know, and I point them out daily. You know, and they don't get it. Thanks, Vicky. God is faithful. I promised you a husband. Didn't say when. I, I didn't say when. A little lessons and patience for all of us. And, you know, and discerning the Spirit, too, isn't it? This is, uh, do I have that right? I just want to get this right. So, Holy Spirit, let me know. Am I on the right path here? That's such a day-to-day operation, isn't it? Getting the message right. Quick Patreon shout out. Hey, thanks, Dean. Dean McVicker. He's part of our Patreon family to make this all go week to week. I always like to ask people why they do what they do. I know when uh, Teresa came to Patreon, I threw that question out. Why? Why support what we do here at Touched by Heaven? Well, because your message needs to be heard. It needs to keep going. You know, I think of non-believers that may just turn on your podcast out of curiosity. And they may switch over and go, I, okay, maybe I'll listen to this. I need to hear something positive today. There's so much negative news. You can't even get past any channel without hearing, you know, doomsday stuff. And so um, I think people are really looking for something else. They they need they, the food for the soul. They're looking for that. And so if you have a non-believer that turns on uh, your podcast and, and finds you and listens to a message that changes things, it changes their perspective. I think it's something easier that they would turn on a podcast rather than maybe a sermon or, you know, walk into a church building or, you know, turn a TV channel to a popular preacher that they may be, maybe there's angels out there. Maybe there is a God. Let me, let me turn this on and listen to it. How are these people touched by heaven? Let me, let me hear this story. And so that's why, because we need avenues in any way that we can have them to reach people who do not know the Lord. They need to know him more now than ever. There is there is a war going on of good versus evil. We need to win people for Christ more now than ever. And so however we can reach them, I want to support. Thanks, Teresa. If you have a why of why you're listening and might just support what we do, then go to touchbyheaven.net and click your way through to Patreon or go to patreon.com and search for Trapper Jack, where we also now, of course, have these downloads available. You don't even have to be a member of Patreon to get the downloads. Just head into our store and you'll find some downloads about, uh, well, they have the talks I do on Mary or Eucharist or did you hear what God just said and other such things. So check that out at patreon.com, search for Trapper Jack, and it's all available for you there. 
I remember it was, I looked it up, 2006. I remember this so well. It was a Newsweek article, and it was just like, what? Here's an article that actually said, if a woman was single and age 40 looking for a guy, she was more likely to be killed by a terrorist than to find that guy, than to find that mate. Everyone went, what? And it got a lot of circulation and belief. It was all nonsense. Not that it's not a challenge necessarily to find somebody. And I tell you, I had these knockdown, drag out arguments with God. Hello, Tammy. Hello. <laughs> I think somebody's home. Where do you live? By Vermilion, South Dakota, where South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa meet. I, I'm in South Dakota. I can see Iowa from my house. From my <laughs> I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's our joke. I'm like, you can see Iowa from our deck. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that's funny. Oh, you said reporter, newspaper, television. What are you? Television. Television? Mm-hmm. Gee, we wish we had video, man. You're obviously attractive. You got to be attracted to be on television. Oh, I used to be. <laughs> used to be attractive. Good. Yeah. I'm like, I used to be cute. <laughs> We all were once. I know, right? Yeah. Oh, if we could all just hold at 27, right? Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and yeah. Uh, how'd you find the podcast? I was looking for podcasts on Medjugorje. I had a friend that mentioned she wanted to go to Medjugorje, listened to one that was really interesting, and then that was only like six episodes long, and then yours came up, and then I just kept listening to you because mm. you're great. Your stories, your um, the, the way you genuinely listen to everybody's story and, and you're just kind and you're reverent that you find, you too see all those God winks. And I just could not, I, I've listened to everything. <laughs> well, that, you got a little bonus then you got a little magicory here and there, and then uh, yes. you get all these other great stories. Aren't they? They are wonderful. They are absolutely wonderful. Yeah, so one day we're going to go to Medjugorje. Very I made good. my husband read, because I read it, and then Wendell, was that his last name? Or Weibel? Weibel. Yep. Yeah. The so kind of, kind I read of the that. original book, yeah. The original. So we both read that, because I was trying to get my husband on board. I think he's on board. <laughs> I think he's on board. <laughs> he's a quiet guy. Yeah. Well, we're... And But here I was, I was... I was in my 40s, I was never married, no children, and I was not happy about it. I was a happy person, but it's this special kind of agony that I felt going through life without my husband. And I cannot, I don't want to take anything away from anybody who's been widowed, but like, I felt like I, I felt that kind of loss in not having my husband, like, like my heart knew him, but I didn't. So uh, you're in your forties and uh, you ever come close to getting married by this point? Never. Nothing. One proposal. Not one. Not one. There, you, you never even came close. Never. No. Okay. No. And like, I, and I dated plenty and like I, I did, I had dates cause I had girlfriends that I have one girlfriend still who's never been on a date, which tells me how weird men are. <laughs> She's oh, wonderful. Like why wouldn't anybody want to go out with, I mean, and I had dates, but nothing ever worked out. Huh. And so I think that's, that's additionally frustrating, and it's like. Well, Plus, you're wrong? reading all the stats. If you get to your 40s and you've never been married, yeah. and it's just you know, it yeah, doesn't so, look, it doesn't look promising. Wow, it looks like I'm never going to have kids because now I'm in my 40s. And anyway, so it was it was really hard. I really wanted someone to share a life with, and I tell you, I had these knockdown, drag out arguments with God, and then I felt awful for arguing with God, but He can take it. That's how He knows. Yeah, it's just That's prayer. He knows you trust him, right? Even if you're yelling, it's prayer. You're just you're having a conversation. He's okay. Even driving down like a neighborhood street, I'd be like, every single one of these houses has a family in it, and I don't get one. I I suppose that sounds whiny, and people do kind of like if if a single person complains about being single, they're whining. Like, and that's not fair either, because it it is. Well, it's hard. obviously it's you. It must be you. There must, must be something, be you. you know, right, right. Or you yeah. probably put that on yourself. What's wrong with me? Why are you so picky? Yeah. And yeah, there's um, that. And I'm like, well, shouldn't I be? Yeah, it's kind of an important <laughs> uh, about a husband. Kind of an important thing. So, did he answer you finally? Well, so I had so back to these these inspired divine dreams. I had two dreams where I was shown my husband, and in the first one. It was like this outdoor venue, like restaurant or, or something with like the pretty, 
like sparkle light, twinkle lights, Edison lights overhead, you know? And I just felt this overwhelming peace. I was talking to this man who was just wonderful, kind and gentle and interested in me. And, and I could just feel this unconditional love. And there was this overwhelming peace in the whole dream. And that's how I know it's from God, this peace. And he was not showing me, God was not showing me my husband in this dream. He was showing me the peace. The, this is, this is what it's going to feel like when you find that right person. And I had never been so relaxed in my whole life. In fact, for like a whole week, I would just sit back and think about that dream just to feel that peace again. And then I kind of decided, I'm like, well, maybe when I meet my husband, there's going to be these cool twinkle lights above. (laughs) Maybe not. God can do what he wants. We'll see. So then I had probably a few months later, or maybe even a year later, um, I had another dream. And in this one, this the man for me, we were visiting Europe, possibly in Rome, and we entered a historic church. And and the man I was with like pointed to me and he looked up to heaven and just like, thank you. Like he was grateful for me. And I had never had that experience. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow. And I also had that extreme peace, just that peace. You know, what do I do with these dreams? I just I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget them. And so I remember the year I was going to turn 45, like New Year's, I I was like, all right, God, I give up. I've done everything I know how to do. Apparently, I don't know how to get a husband. Um, And I was starting to worry that I was making a husband an idol. And so like, I really, I need to let go of this, right? So I told God, if you have this for me, you have to do it. i tried everything I can think of. And, and, and by the way, you're going to have to just hit me over the head with a frying pan. Cause apparently I'm blind too. Not like you, but, um, <laughs> so then when that new year came around, I was going to unsubscribe from any of the matchmaking, the dating websites, anything like that. But it was new years. And I saw the Catholic match had, a they were offering a whole year for $60 and it's usually $60 a month. And I'm like, well, can't turn down a bargain like that. And I announced to all my cousins, I'm like, all right, I need you all to pray with me. We're going to pray the novena to St. Anne for me to find a husband. <laughs> this is it. I'm for, I'm for turning 45 this year. St. Anne, <laughs> who is the mother of Mary. St. Saint Anne, yes, the mother of Mary. And okay. so they agreed because I got the friends involved too. And so some of the single friends were like, well, pray for me too. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. And then on St. Anne's feast day, which is what the... 26th of July. I was living in Denver. So in, in Arvada, just outside of Denver, there's a shrine of St. Anne. So I was like, that'll be my pilgrimage. So I went to the shrine of St. Anne and I prayed. There's like a little grotto off the side of the altar. And and then on August 15th, I was matched with a man, but he had such a warm smile and like really kind eyes. And he was widowed and he wrote in his profile that he was, he supposed, looking for his new best friend. So we talked for a while and then we like met up in September. We met up for dinner. And then a couple of days later, he's like, I'd like to see you again. We, how about how about we meet at the Botanic Gardens? And we did. We had tea and walked around and that was nice. And then so then on our third date, we had dinner at a restaurant. And then over next door was like this outdoor beer garden. And we're sitting there talking. And I looked up and here's the twinkle lights crisscrossed above the outdoor seating area. And I was like, I knew it. I knew this had to be the guy. <laughs> got your twinkle lights. Good. I got sign. my twinkle lights. Nice. And um, so then we were engaged about a year and a month later. And then we got married pretty quickly after that. So were I you mean, then 46 or seven? What were you then? Yes, I was 46 turning 47. It was okay. like a month before my 47th birthday. And so I was looking for a unicorn. It, it was it was impossible. His family's been absolutely wonderful. But look at that. I was praying to St. Anne and I got my, my answer on the feast of the assumption. So yeah, the, the odds, right? I have, I have a good friend that uh, she got married for the first time 50 ish. And, and to, to your point, she was just sure that this was not going to happen. Just sure. It was not going to happen. And it was then, impossible. Yeah, and like, then suddenly if God wants something, you know, mm-hmm. God bless you, Tammy. Love you. God bless you. All right. Take care. Love you too. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, she got her guy. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tammy. And again, to Gina 
and are 25 years of waiting for a conversion story. But can you imagine? It's beyond all expectations how beautiful that conversion was. And of course, with Vicky and that and the vision of the the kid and the bike and how that came to fruition. I just beautiful patience and waiting and prayer and more prayer and more prayer. But God is always faithful, and that you never wait alone. You never wait alone. Uh, thank you for being faithful. Look, you made it all the way to the end of the episode. You're faithful again. How about that? And thanks for your help at patreon.com. Remember, we've got those downloads now about the Eucharist, about Mary, about did you hear what God just said waiting for you. And I will see you next week here at Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I'm Trapper Jack. Who is this guy? I thought I made it clear, but if I must say it again, I'm Trapper Jack. I think I got ID. Who is this guy?